buffering. There we go. Hey, welcome to another marvelous day. This is Justin Howell, and we are live at Scott's Chapel Church in Nashville, Tennessee. We are going through the series Justice and the Prophets, uh, focusing on Old Testament prophets and God's justice. I'm eager to read today's scripture in the hopes that we can hear God's message and take into heart what's written in it, uh, because I, Book of Jeremiah just has a lot of eye-opening experiences. And by meditating on it every day, we can delight in its deeper meaning, prosper from its practice, and just find its many blessings that God has to offer. Hey, Sean. <laughs> Our scripture today will focus on Jeremiah 22, 1 to 10. The lesson is going to be repent of injustice. I want to start by telling you, last week I told you about a favorite movie of mine when I was a kid. Now I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite TV shows as a kid, Power Rangers. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of it but it was like big in the 90s fighting monsters like looking good doing it um my brother and i we dressed up as it in halloween let me pull up a picture real fast but it was just um i just loved it because the good guys always won you know who the good guys were you knew who the bad guys were you'd never want to be you want to be the good looking color-coded spandex wearing good guys but here's a there's a picture of my brother and me in our Power Ranger outfits, but it was just a it was just a non-complicated fun TV show back then. Um, but I do want to say that sometimes it's not as clear cut as TV. Show. Like sometimes it's a lot harder to steer away from injustice nowadays, and that's what we're going to talk about in Jeremiah 22, 1 to 10. This is what the Lord says. Go down to the palace of the king of Judah and proclaim this message here. Hear the word of the Lord to you, king of Judah, you who sit on David's throne, you, your officials, and your people who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do, not, do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. For if you are careful to carry out these commands, then kings who sit on David's throne will come through the gates of this place, riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by their officials and their people. But if you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this palace will become a ruin. For this is what the Lord says about the palace of the king of Judah. Though you are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon, I will surely make you a wasteland like towns not inhabited. I will send destroyers against you, each man with his weapons, and they will cut up your fine cedar beams and throw them into the fire. People from many nations will pass by the city and will ask one another, why has the Lord done such a thing to this great city? And the answer will be because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and have worshiped and served other gods. Do not weep for the dead king or mourn his loss. Rather, weep bitterly for him who is exiled because he will never return nor see his native land again. I talked a good bit about the historical context in the last lesson. So I'll give a little background of Jeremiah's position this time around. Jeremiah is the prophet commissioned by God in a land surrounded by false prophets and teachers. His courage as the true spokesman is clearly evident in his outspokenness against those who have made false claims and the priests who have abused their office. By this time, after long periods of a neglectful people, Jeremiah is like, he's just outraged at the dishonor he suffers because of his faithfulness to God's word, while the false prophets who are adulterers, wicked, and godless, they get to enjoy popularity throughout the land, even in the Jerusalem temple. Then they are not the ones chosen by God. Why do you think that is? Why do people keep listening to these false teachings when these prophets have no true loyalty to God? There's, at this time, there's just no sense of right or wrong with, uh, the, in these lessons. I think it's because their primary concern, the false prophet's primary concern, isn't to spread the word of God, but it's to please their audience with words of hope prosperity and peace and we eat that up we don't care how we get there in the last chapter king zedekiah sent messengers to the prophet but at this point in time god has tasked jeremiah to go himself to the house of the king and demand his attention so you see that this is god's not waiting for the king to come to him this time but he is sending jeremiah directly 
to talk about his word. And you can see that by saying here, this is what the word, uh, this is what the Lord has to say. And Jeremiah's message is pretty straightforward to follow. In verses one through five, God made a simple call to the house of David to change course, repent, and return to the Lord. Uh, this draws a similar parallel in the New Testament in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as hens gather their chicks under the, her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus shows that this is not an act of retribution, but an act of pure love to try to steer people from paths of destruction. And that has parallels today. God allows us to exercise free will. That's a part of his love. He, give us, he gives us commands, but we're not robots. We're not autonomous. He's given us that choice to live. And it's our choice whether to choose good and live or choose evil and suffer. Therefore, we have to pay attention to the messages God sends to us through his faithful servants, like Jeremiah. Uh, the messages aren't coming through spirits or ghosts, but through human beings like us. Uh, that way we can connect to the message better. That's, that's a big reason why the Son of God was sent down as a human as well, so we can... Uh, we were able to connect to Jesus in that manner, connect to our Savior. And we have to do the same with our prophets. A key commandment in verse 3 that I want to draw your attention to is to deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed. This had been mentioned previously in chapter 21 as this is close to God's heart. This is very important to him. Um, and it goes on to list the three kinds of victims that are most vulnerable in biblical times. Um, and that's it reaches... and these, uh, these three people are mentioned together 16 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. I'll go back to repeat who they are. They're the, they're the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widow. The, the fatherless could also be like orphans. And these are, these are people who suffer. These are people who are close to God's heart. And we tend to forget that justice is supposed to be all-inclusive. It reaches the saved and unsaved, the fortunate and the poor, uh, simply because God cares about everyone. Why do we tend to miss these opportunities? I know, especially in Nashville, oh, we are quite blessed to have a lot of we are quite blessed to have a lot of organize, organizations that try to reach out the homeless or the poor, um, because it is a very persistent problem. Sometimes we just tend to miss these people who are struggling. Simply because we, I don't know, there could be many reasons. It could be simply because we're comfortable in our own circles. Or when our actions towards God's justice feel like we're fighting against the world. It's one against a crowd. Um, especially against a world that doesn't adhere to God's commandments or God's standards. But... Moving into verse 4, God is calling us into obedience, and he calls us to do good, promising his blessings, even if the world doesn't have anything to offer. In one of Paul's letters, he encourages Corinthians to be steadfast, working with excellence, knowing that work done for God is not done in vain. Um, and this is reiterated in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Last lesson, we talked about how God sent prophet after prophet to warn both kings and commoners of pending destruction, but they didn't listen. They acted as though they had God's favor no matter what. And this is a very important part of this lesson is we have to, like, it's a, it's a kind of a shock factor when you hear that God is punishing or uh, he's delivering divine retribution on his own people. But we have to recognize that we have to own up to our own problems, our own decisions. For Alcoholics Anonymous, I gave this analogy to a friend one time. Their first rule is acknowledging that you have a problem, and that's how you fix it. That's how we fix our sins. We have to acknowledge that we are sinful people first. 
And by verse five, God, God demonstrates the consequences of embracing sin, of embracing injustice. Sin has often been the ruin of royal palaces, no matter how strong. And this sentence is ratified by an oath, I swear by myself. The more significant or powerful the thing sworn on, the more definite and absolute the promise. And here God is swearing by himself. There is nothing and no, nothing more significant, permanent, or powerful than God. Uh, Hebrews 6.13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. In verses 6 and 7, God goes into depth of the impending judgment. He must show how fatal their wickedness, wick, wickedness would be to their kingdom as well to themselves, to Jerusalem, because he made a, pro he made a promise by himself. Um, and since he is a justice-loving God, he has to follow through on that promise, even if it is his own people, especially because it's own people. God shows his love by disciplining his people. Like um, a parent shows love by disciplining their children and steering them towards the right direction. Um, it's pointed out that Judah and Jerusalem had been valuable in God's eyes. Thou art Gilead unto me and the head of Lebanon. God uses imagery to affirm how precious his people are to him. They are, were supposed to be as rich and pleasant as Gilead, as stately as this alone doesn't protect them. Um, I, I'm sure many a times, sorry, making sure my connection is good. That's why many a times I think Christians say, tend to try to get away with things because they say that, oh, well, God loves me. He won't let anything bad happen to me. But once again, we have to own up to our consequences or own up to our decisions that could lead to consequences. Uh, the country that was as fruitful as Gilead would be as bare as a wilderness. The cities that were as strong as Lebanon would be uninhabitable, uninhabitable cities. Um, and when the country is laid waste, the cities would be depopulated. Like, see how easily God's judgments can ruin a nation and how sin is the backbone of it. The destroyers, the, the destroyers here are the Babylonians, also mentioned in the last chapter and last lesson, in which the Babylonians will burn everything of significance before leaving back to their home. So the warning in this passage was a stern warning. Still, it was a warning, bo it was a warning born out of love out of divine love, and it was not a complex message. If the king and his family decided to disobey God, they would, they would come, it would just come crashing down on them. Uh, they would go from privilege to pitiful. God's own personal involvement in the restoration of his people is the theme of Jeremiah's message. The shepherds are under judgment because they fail to tend and care for their flock. Uh, to take care of the people. God's plan is to restore and to care for the lost and the scattered of his flock. This is the duty of good and faithful shepherds. This is the duty of good and faithful kings. But the failure to do this led to destruction so devastating that it would make world news. Verses 8 and 9, at how look at how people of other nations would react to it. It would be a great devastation that would get global attention, and they will know immediately why the land is a wasteland, because they turned away from God. At first, there is almost puzzlement by the nations in the verses. Like, why in the world would the Lord allow such a magnificent city as Jerusalem be destroyed? There's, And they come to one conclusion and one conclusion only. The people have forsaken the covenant. The city and its ruling class, its citizens more generally, have failed to live by the commandments and the requirements of justice and righteousness that were set forth in the covenant. Now, this city isn't doing anything different than what other nations do. So that might be where the puzzlement is coming from because they are they're wondering why they are getting so much more punishment. And that's because they were God's chosen people. They were supposed to live by a different standard. Uh, finally, in verse 10, we see messages about King Josiah's sons. Kings at this time were like gods to the people, but they are still men to God and still die like men. So it appears in these verses where we have a sentence of death passed on to the two kings who reigned successfully in Jerusalem. Uh, these were two brothers, Jehoiakim and Shalom. 
the two sons of King Josiah. King Josiah actually had four sons, but this section is, um, this chapter is looking into uh, two of his sons. Last week we talked about his other son, Zedekiah. Uh, note that Josiah had actually been a good king, but now we're in the period of two ungrateful sons. These kings failed to promote justice and righteousness and to guarantee the right of the foreigners, the orphan, the widow, and the innocent. And the contrast between them and their fa father, Josiah, includes a discussion of true religion, uh, what it means to know God. Like in James 1, 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The essential quality of a leader is his hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness for all and his particular care for the poor and needy. Once again, we are going back to um, the foreigners, the poor, the widows, the orphans, the people who desperately need help. Um, we just keep going back to this because the people who are in the people who've been blessed, the people who are in good positions need to pass on those blessings. They need to pass on whatever God has given to them. It's like being a salt of the earth or a light of the world. We spread that light. It isn't supposed to be contained and it isn't supposed to be hoarded in. And the point of the Oracle in verse 10 is that the people who had pinned their hopes so thoroughly on Josiah as the king, who would restore the kingdom and overthrow all foreign domination should not hold on to those lost hopes. Josiah was unfortunately gone. He had, he was one of the greatest kings of that period after a slew of terrible kings, honestly. But now that he was gone, God was telling them that they can't pine over the past anymore. Um, it's now time to mourn over the next king, Shalom, son of Josiah who is about to go into exile and will never come back. So you see Jeremiah's predictions of death and exilation coming true for the kings, uh, for the kings that the people have put on high. And this is honestly just very humbling for them uh, because they believe that they have this protection. But their, their foundation isn't in God for that protection. Their foundation is the title of being God's chosen. And the force of Jeremiah's prophecy has been God's warning of destruction unless they turn from their sinful ways. And God calls us to do the same challenge he presented through Jeremiah. Either we will represent the character of God as expressed in Jesus to become more Christ-like and in our actions expose and eliminate injustice to the oppressed or we'll risk experiencing God in ways we will not like or could possibly imagine. But we said before, this can be difficult for various reasons. This isn't an episode of Power Rangers, unfortunately, where the good guy always wins. Sometimes the world is against us, or they don't adhere to the justice God promises. As in Ecclesiastes 3.16, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. Our courts on earth are still tainted by wickedness and sin. It feels like we can't make a change. Even Jeremiah was under constant fear of death, of being ridiculed, of basically standing alone against the crowds of people and kings he ministered to. Like if you read the book of Jeremiah, it's it's daunting. If you can see the in, you see the inside of Jeremiah's mind of how frustrated he is in trying to work with the people that just do not listen. But we have to remember that God is the highest authority, even if we have wickedness spread throughout our earthly courts. In due time, everyone has to answer to him. The poor, the rich, the righteous, the wicked, everyone answers to God eventually. And God would contradict Jeremiah's worries, saying that in the face of powerful opposition, God would make Jeremiah as strong as iron. And we have to remember that we have that promise too, if we obey him, if we go, if we take that step forward to deliver justice. And this speaks volumes to us. In our present situation where the world is in turmoil from the sickness and fear of COVID-19, we are in a prime time to be a light to our world. So again, and I asked you guys this last time, I want you to think what justice would look like in these present times. 
Uh, right now, it means different things to so many people. Every country has their different views, and each demographic has their own definition. But we have to start by trusting in God's promises to heal the hurt and broken. So in Jeremiah, the king's trust in the, his own wisdom meant injustice prevailed. Uh, which sins of injustice need correcting today? Are there acts of commission where wrong is being done? Are there acts of omission where we fail to do what's right? So that's all I wanted to say today. I really hope that you can just think about um, not, not to be daunted by the injustice that occurs in this world, but just think about the power that God has to work through you if we obey him and just try to be that light onto other people and just to show that hope. Even if people don't listen at first, we have to be as strong as iron and persist. Um, but if you, like the, if you like this message, I just pray that you can continue to take it into your heart and just uh, live it out every day. That's really all that we ask for. Um, that's all I had to say today. If you like this video, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, share this video, share this message. Just get out there. Um, thanks to Sean Jenkins that you saw in the background a little bit for uh, tag teaming these studies with me. Uh, be sure to support him through his Instagram. Uh, the links are probably somewhere below. Uh, he has, what, do you, what does he have? Uh, Instagram, PayPal. Uh, just, uh, just look at his videos too. We want to spread these messages to as many people as possible. Just so, And we love that people like you love, love God enough to be here. So I thank you. So I want us to uh, close out in some prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for, I just thank you for the people that you brought here today, listening to this message, listening to your word, and just because they love you, Lord. They love other people and they want to learn how to grow. So I pray that you instill in us a heart of justice, just to be able to help all the broken people, all the poor people, all the widows and the orphans, as you say, and just help anyone in need. And I pray that we don't, we don't live in a society of fear, that we aren't overcome by all the things that bring us anxiety, but that we live in an atmosphere of love that allows us to be able to move forward and just move your kingdom. So I thank you for all that you've done, these important lessons that you've given us, and just all the people that you allow us, allow to be intersected with our lives that we can share this with. So thank you for all that you've done and everything that you will. In Jesus' heavenly name, amen. All right, thanks for joining, and I hope you tune in for more content. Y'all stay blessed. Oh, hey.